Welcome to the Property Management Mastermind Show with your host, Brad Larson. Brad owns one of the fastest growing property management companies in San Antonio, Texas. This podcast is for property managers by property managers. You'll hear from industry leading professionals on best practices, new ideas, success stories, and lessons learned. This is your opportunity to learn about the latest industry buzz surrounding property management, as well as tips and strategies to improve your business. As more tenant-friendly legislations are passed, from reduced security deposits to no evictions in the winter months, and everything in between, in the future, the landlord's income will be ultimately affected, and even being driven out of their rental business. Property managers and landlords need to make sure their voices are heard to help reduce the tide of these increasing laws that will ultimately make owning a rental property more difficult and costly. Let your landlords know about Shorevestor's Landlord Protection Insurance to help them protect their rental income. Call us at 800-975-0562 or visit shorevestor.com to learn more about Shorevestor and how it can help you protect your landlord's income and grow your business. Need a repair at 2 a.m.? Easy does it. Easy Repair coordinates maintenance and nothing else and takes after-hour maintenance calls for property managers working with your property management software so you can see exactly what Easy is doing without leaving your own software. From Las Vegas, Nevada, our full-time maintenance coordinators will dispatch your work orders directly with your vendors. Give us a call at 800-488-6032 or visit our website, easyrepairhotlinellc.com. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Property Manager Mastermind Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Larson. And today's guest, I've got Mr. Robert Gilstrap here, a property management company owner from the Atlanta, Georgia market. And the reason I've got Robert on today is, well, he's famous, right? He, he is actually now famous. He was on Fox News yesterday discussing the CDC moratorium. So we're going to get on and kick this around a little bit. Now, I got to warn you, we're, we're strong conservatives here on this particular show. So we are going to potentially lean towards one side or the other. You can flip a coin which side that's going to be. But we're going to talk a few down and dirty things, how this is going to affect property managers, owners that we manage for, investors and everything else. So to give you a quick background, I'm going to introduce Robert from there. Is Robert has worked with some attorneys and they've actually filed a lawsuit against the CDC for this moratorium that's gone into effect until the early October timeframe. And so without further ado, make sure I didn't butcher that introduction. Mr. Robert, how are you doing today? Doing great, doing great. The, Thanks uh, for coming on. So let's give me some background here about what's going on with the CDC moratorium and how that turned out into a lawsuit from your side. Well, if you remember, uh, as much as I don't like to admit it, or maybe our, us conservatives don't like to admit it, this all really started back with Donald Trump. And Donald Trump was the very first one who directed the CDC to try and find any kind of method or means to uh, to do an eviction moratorium. And they did so. And of course, Biden just kept kept it in place and uh, and kept extending it and perpetuating it. And so it was just as illegal when Donald Trump did it. And uh, and I was up in arms back then about it. And uh, uh, we tried to get Narpum to do some stuff about it. That really didn't work at the time. Um, I think it all took us by it took us all by surprise, really, that uh, that they would even try and do something so blatantly uh, that's severely that much of an overreach. Let's put it that way. Yeah, let's and, let's uh, define what's going on here. So the CDC came in and basically said that you cannot evict any tenant uh, that has not paid rent. And they have some stipulations in there. We can get into it because it's almost kind of comical. We talked about it in the green room. We're both kind of laughing at it because it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And when we talk conservative values, that does not mean Republican or Democrat, because you can have either side of the aisle can have conservative values. But we do represent business owners, which is owners of management, uh, excuse me, owners of homes that we manage. They are essentially a small business. So, so what happens is the government has come in and said, you can no longer run your small business like you've been normally accustomed to, that property rights no longer apply, that you don't get any leeway for the mortgages that you have because 80% of the, the homes that are out there for rental properties have mortgages. And so it's really kind of a one-sided system and it's irritating to say the least. So without further ado on that, kind of tell me about how you 
formulated this lawsuit and who's kind of the parties to it and kind of where do you think this is going? Yeah, I mean, the go- well, what the government's done is they, they've inserted them. I mean, you mentioned this, but they've inserted themselves into the, the private contracts of individuals. And the, A, the government has no legal authority or basis to do that. And definitely a small quasi-governmental agency like the Centers for, Dis- for Disease Control definitely does not have. I mean, common sense would tell you this, right? I mean, it, what would give the CDC the authority to uh, change the law for 230 million Americans? Uh, it, it just is nonsensical that, that they would even think that they would have this power. And, uh, and by the way, it's the same power that originated uh, after the uh, after the 19, what was it, 19, uh, was it 1913? When, when was the Spanish flu? Was that 1918, 17? I can't remember. Yeah, 18, 19, 20, yeah, yeah. the Spanish flu. And, you know, they had the power then to fumigate and, you know, kill affected animals and stuff like that. And so somehow they've morphed that into... And oh, by the way, we can prevent anybody from getting evicted anywhere in the United States. And when you think about it, it's just really uh, insane that that they even came to this non-logical conclusion. But uh, but not surprising for government, because that's what government does, right? They, they overreach all the time. Tell me more and, about the uh, lawsuit that you're involved with now. Yeah, so we uh, I got with uh, the National Association of Realtors, um, you know, largest lobbying organization in the United States. Uh, is NAR, and um, and they have attorneys. Uh, the Jones Day Law Firm in Washington D.C., um, huge, very well respected law firm that kind of makes their living out of suing the government, right? And um, and they know what they're doing. They, you know, really good good attorneys. So we had uh, we went through a couple of iterations of how it was going to be done. We ended up doing uh, NAR was a plaintiff. The Alabama Association of Realtors was a plaintiff. Uh, actually, I'll tell you that NAR, I'm not sure if NAR is strictly a plaintiff. They are by extension because GAR and AAR from Alabama uh, are part of NAR. And so the Alabama Association of Realtors, Georgia Association of Realtors, and then one representative plaintiff uh, from Georgia and Alabama uh, one company who just so happens to be a realtor, me and my company. So me individually, I'm a plaintiff plus my company title one management is a plaintiff and the same for the guy in Alabama. And, um, we filed in, uh, federal district court in the sixth circuit, which is in Washington, DC, uh, rather than some of the other, uh, cause there were lots of these court cases that have already been filed. Um, we filed ours on purpose in the Sixth Circuit in D.C. because what we had already seen is some of the other people who had filed and won uh, in their, uh, you know, in their court case at the at the federal level. Basically, the government said, OK, well, that's great for you. That means that you're exempt from the law, but everybody else in America is still subject to it. And which is just more, you know, smoke and mirrors for the government. Right. And uh, but we knew that there's a there's a precedent in uh, the D.C. District Court because they rule over Washington, D.C., um, that if if we got it passed there, it would apply to everybody in the United States. And um, so we on purpose filed there. It took a little bit longer, but um, we on purpose filed for that reason in that district. And um, so we went before uh, Judge Dabney Friedrich and we won. And the government immediately appealed that to the uh, appellate court in that same district. And that case has not been heard yet. Um, But in the meantime, even though she ruled for us, she said, but I'm going to stay my order um, because the government was like, oh, you know, people are dying, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we need to stay your order right now until it hits appeal. And and it's pretty common for them to do that. So she did. She stayed her order. appeal order, we went to that appellate court and said, no, it should not be stayed. Um, You know, landlords are losing billions of dollars a month. I want to say it was 13 billion a month, or it could be even more than that. Um, They denied our request. Uh, They're a pretty liberal uh, uh, appellate court. And um, so our next step was to go to the, you told me to put everything on silent. Um, the next step was to go to uh, 
the United States Supreme Court. And because that's the only thing that's above, you know, that's above them. So we did that. And it basically was, it was not on the case itself. It was only on, hey, we want this stay removed and give us a ruling whether or not you'll remove this stay. And what the Supreme Court did was pretty unusual. Not only did they give us their up or down vote, which again is kind of weird. Um, they, they not only gave us a yes or no on the stay, but they actually wrote a written opinion by Justice Judge uh, or uh, Justice Kavanaugh did. And that's pretty unusual because that's not, they, they didn't have to do that. And, uh, and in that opinion, they basically said exactly what we've said all along. The CDC has no legal authority whatsoever to do that. And, it, but the weirdness that came about was Judge Kavanaugh said, but I, him individually, is going to vote to deny our petition to remove the stay because uh, there's only 30 days left. It's only till the end of July, and we want more time for government money to get out, and we don't want to hinder that. So I'm going to vote to deny your, uh, you know, your your stay request because it'll all be over with anyway in 30 days. But he clarified that, yep, they do not have any authority to do this. Um, so a couple of things that, that are odd about that, that I think people ought to really be, um, it's, it's very puzzling to me that a sitting justice on the United States Supreme Court agreed that the United States government did something illegal and was continuing to do it and said, but we're going to continue to let them for another 30 days. To me, that is baffling. I, I mean, if you or I do something wrong, we go to jail. You know, or it, but when when the government does it, well, you know, we'll just we'll look the other way, and um, at least for another thirty days. And of course, lo and behold, what did the government do? They didn't end it at the end of thirty days. They just said, "Hey, we're going to do it anyway." That pretty much just empowered our current uh, president's team to do whatever they want at that regard, uh, yeah. because they've they've gone through the court system. And you know, I got to say kudos to you for explaining that because a lot of people didn't realize you were that deep into it. It takes a couple, you know, property managers from Alabama and Georgia to get together to go all the way to the Supreme Court uh, and fight on our behalf as an entire nation of landlords. And so, I, again, I thank you for going through that effort. That's quite a bit. Uh, you've had to go through some headaches, some head, some some hassles, some expense, and all that's on our behalf. So appreciate that very much. Now, that's that also ties into something I've said for a decade that judges don't follow law. They just rule however they want to rule. And you could talk JP level with the most backwater judge in the smallest county in your state to now the Supreme Court. Uh, the chief justice says that eh, we're not going to follow those laws. We're just going to rule this way. But, you know, we'll, we'll continue to do whatever we want to let the, the government do whatever they want. And it's just it's just they don't follow the law. Which is, and that's the most which is also, part. Which is also weird, too, because it was though the 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 reasoning behind it was we're going to allow this to continue because we don't want to hamper the government's efforts to continue giving out relief money. And I was like, how would this hamper the efforts? That, I mean, the government is giving out relief money regardless. So it's not just because this is here that, that you know, you lifting the stay is not going to, to halt that. And in fact, it wouldn't have anything to do with, it. they would continue to, you know, to do whatever they were doing. And um, so, yeah, it's kind of baffling. So where we're at now is we immediately, once the Biden administration uh, came out with a new uh, eviction moratorium, and this time, the only difference period from the first one to this one is that uh, it now only covers people in counties where it's 80% 80, 80 or higher, some places 90, and which by the way is 85% of the United States uh, in the state of Georgia, it's virtually the entire state, almost 100%. And um, so, and oddly enough, whenever we went to court um, uh, two days ago uh, with, uh, or actually, no, yesterday, um, we were back in federal district court because, okay, the Supreme Court did their little ruling. The Biden administration said, we're going to do it anyway. So now we're back to like, okay, what do you do? I mean, when the president of the United States doesn't follow what the Supreme Court does, what do you do? And it's kind of weird, but we literally had to go back down to a lower court, um, back down to Judge Friedrich's court, 
and that's what we did yesterday, and say, hey, judge, we need, uh, you know, we need an emergency motion to stop the government from doing this. We need you to clarify that, hey, here's what the United States Supreme Court said. No, you can't do it. And uh, so we're waiting on her ruling right now. I expect it today. I actually expected it last night. Um, and I would love to say that I'm 100% confident on how she's going to rule, but I'm not because there's some procedural things uh, that matter. And, um, and it's stuff about who has authority over what ruling and why. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of weird and it's, it's legal and technical, but I'm hoping that she's going to rule in our favor that, uh, you know, that we'll, we'll stop the, the current, you know, the current CDC uh, moratorium. Well, that is hopeful because even if she does rule in your favor and enforce the ruling, remove the stay, they're going to uh, appeal. Yeah, they're just going to appeal it and drag it out. I think their motive, their uh, their mo on this deal is to basically drag this out as long as they can, get into October, uh, and that way, up uh, at that point, the courts will be like, "Well, it's already up anyway, so why are we even ruling on it?" Uh, they won't rule on it at the end of the day because they don't want to set a precedent, uh, in my opinion. Because if they start saying that you know a little guy in some in some little town can send something up to the CDC all of a sudden and then overrule them, that's going to just I don't know. It's just going to encourage everybody to to sue. And I I believe you. I to, I believe in what you're doing. I, I want to talk more about the absolute craziness of some of these stipulations in here because that will start to make people realize this stuff is not about necessarily helping people. Yeah. It's doing what they want to do. So I'm going to quote you a couple of things. It's all about it, it is. And so I'm looking at the, you know, I found a nice website, texaslawhelp.com. Who does the CDC order protect? Uh, who does the CDC order to protect from eviction? And so it says you have to have all of these stipulations to uh, be a part of that pool that's going to be allowed to hide under the shelter of the eviction moratorium. And the income portion really started to make yeah. no sense to me because if you make more than $99,000 in 2020, you are outside of the realm of this protection. Right. So it's not about the actual virus. It's about who's making what is protecting the poor. If you received economic impact payment, right, that's going to potentially eliminate or qualify you. Yeah. And so these things are tied into the CDC uh, outline. And it's just making you realize that it's almost it's almost rigged. You know, Robert, Absolutely. if I say that, am I, am I out of touch with things to say that? What, what do you think? Well, I mean, I don't know. You tell me, does, does COVID magically pass over people and look at their checking account and then not affect them if they make, you know, $99,001? So it's, it's ridiculous and nonsensical. The, the entire premise of the case is that, well, gosh, if we allow evictions, there are going to be mass, massive COVID everywhere and people are going to die in the streets everywhere they're not going to be able to they're all going to be homeless they're going to be dying in the streets which if, if you go back and look at virtually everything that has been said about covid by the government from day one how much of it has been correct virtually nothing and i mean and of course every day more information comes to light where you you know where you find out more uh major major problems and, uh, you know, where they've lied about this or that. And it's just, it's ridiculous. It's so, uh, this is pandering and it's not about poor people or rich people or it's about control. I mean, it's, it's all about control. So in, in my opinion, that's obviously a lot of this is political. Uh, you have the uh, Democrat held positions now that the Biden administration, they're coming in to make policies that benefit their voter base, sure. uh, regardless of law, regardless of precedent, regardless of, uh, taxpaying uh, individuals, they're, they're pandering to these individuals to get them to vote for them the next election. Right. And, you know, maybe that's, that's conspiracy theory stuff on my end. But uh, when you look at some of these details, it's, it's not about helping people with coronavirus. It's more about helping the people that don't make enough money. Right. And so that's exactly what a political stance is. It's political yeah. stance to a certain party. And I don't believe in it. I'm sure you don't believe in it. Obviously, you've gone through the trouble and and heartache to work on this. Uh, where do you think this goes from here as far as, you know, you gave us the update, but where do you think this is going to actually go towards the end of this? So you think we're going to make some headway here? 
Yeah, I mean, if, uh, you know, regardless of how Judge Friedrich rules, uh, like you said, it'll be appealed either by us or by them. Uh, the next appeal will be back to the Sixth Circuit, Sixth Circuit Appellate Court, the same court who has yet to hear the appeal. Um, but our motion, our emergency motion will have to be heard in front of that court. That'll take slightly longer than it did in front of Judge Friedrich. Um, if they deny us, then we'll be back at the Supreme Court. And it would be pretty unusual, in my opinion, for the Supreme Court to say, no, even though we just told you that everything was illegal, they were doing it all illegal, uh, but now we're not going to do it. So if we could just go directly to the Supreme Court, I think it would be perfect. But it doesn't work that way. And um, and when you said that this is all designed, it, it to me that's not conspiracy. That is a very, very common tactic of the federal government when they do lawsuits is it, you can plan things out that you know that you can keep. And, and by the way, they already admitted this. I mean, they pretty much admitted it. Um, first of all, if you remember uh, wonderful uh, Maxine Waters, who basically said, why shouldn't we do the eviction moratorium, a new one with the CDC? Who's going to stop us? Who's, well, she said, who's going to stop them? And, uh, and she's exactly right. I mean, what do you do when, when the federal government doesn't follow the law or the court's? Who is going to stop them? And then, of course, the Biden administration said the same thing. And I want to say it was Joe Biden himself that said it, was that, hey, we know we don't have any legal standing here. I'm paraphrasing this. But we'll get this in the court system. And by the time it works its way through the court system, it'll be over. And That's exactly what he said. And yeah, that's, a, that's what I'm saying. I mean, we're paraphrasing, but that's exactly what they said. And they yeah, said and that, 15 that, times, we know we don't have any legal authority to do this. I, yet they did it anyway. I, you know, to me, that is indefensible as a no matter what side of the aisle you're on, that is just indefensible to me. And, and that yeah. shows that shows bad faith to the courts. And generally, when the courts see when you file things that are bogus or frivolous or you go directly against what the court has told you, um, they usually punish you pretty bad. Don't know if that's going to happen in this case, though. I hope it does. So do you or any of your landlords that you represent as a property management company, do you have any stories for us about landlords suffering because of this? I mean, tenants not paying rent for 18 months and they have to like spend their life savings. I mean, do you have anything like that? Yeah, we've gotten uh, a couple of landlords that are, that are facing uh, foreclosure or bankruptcy because they've not received any money, of course. And, and remember, it's not just the mortgage payment that they have to make um, because of course there is no, uh, moratorium on foreclosures, oddly enough. Um, and there shouldn't be because that would be just as unlawful. But um, remember, these guys still have to pay the taxes, the insurance. They've still got to maintain the property. I mean, we're going out, you know, replacing leaky faucets and, and, and toilets and, and people who haven't paid rent in, in over a year. So, you know, now granted, we're in Atlanta, so we're not the highest rent market in the nation or anything, but I've got lots of people who are way above 20,000 in owed rent. And, uh, you know, are they ever going to see that money? No. And, and this is where the, and so first of all, it's not about the money. And that's, that's the one thing that where I kind of break from, from GAR and NAR and, and stuff like that. They see it as a, and I understand why they're a nationwide organization. They want, and, and you've seen NARPM do this too. You know, they send out these call to actions Hey, tell Congress just to hurry up and get money out to appease the landlords, and that way it'll solve the problem of the moratorium because everybody would be current on rent. But, I mean, that's a as an American, man, you ought to be cringing at that because that is just further diluting the value of the dollar, uh, and it's unprecedented. I mean, it's never been done in the history of our country what we've done in the last couple of years here, and, uh, and it's horrific, and, and it's what's driving massive inflation. And... Um, it, it's just not a good, it's not a good solution. Handing me my own tax dollars back is, is a slap in the face, right? I pay taxes. I send the government a big fat check every year. And, uh, you know, handing me that money back and calling it free money is just a lie. Uh, and then all they do is print brand new money and then we get massive inflation. So it's, it's not a solution. Yeah, clearly we're seeing inflation take place. I mean, just for the few things I've done in the last six months, you see all the differences in the pricing of, of where it was six months ago, a year ago, and all of a sudden, well, it's you know 20% more, 15% more. In addition, another side effect is 
the massive amount of jobs that are available. Now, I heard the other day there's like eight or nine million. Nobody, right. So if you're if you're crying about unemployment, if you're crying about people not finding jobs or being able to work, that's not necessarily true because there's you know last report I heard there's like nine million available jobs, and just drive around your local area, look at all the restaurants, and everybody's offering four, you know, basically uh, hiring type signs everywhere. Uh, they're offering bonuses. I was just driving uh, the other day. I went to uh, where was it? I saw a Whataburger. So if you go to work at Whataburger, which is a fast food chain, you get a $300 signing bonus just to, to, to sign up and start working there. That's how difficult it is to get people to work. And then you put the mask mandates on them and the, the glove mandates. And, and it's just an uncomfortable way to go to work. And they're like, screw it. I don't have to do this because I don't have to pay my rent. Or well, I'm getting well, a big check. Fat even work. check. Yeah. Not only do I not have to pay my rent, I can sit at home and collect a check from the government which remember most of the states are still receiving federal uh, unemployment benefit money, Georgia. And uh, I, must, I hope Texas did. I'm not sure if they did, but I would think they did. You know, Georgia, Florida, most of the conservative states have said, whoa, 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 no, stop. We don't want that money. And the federal government tried to sue those states and force them to take money and give it out to citizens, which of course, just giving out free money to people. Why would they want to go work? I mean, if I can sit at home and make $850 a week, and, you know, granted, that's not what I could live on, but it's what a lot of people can live on. And uh, it, so it's, it's despicable what they're doing, and they've set up a, a system where it just perpetuates all of this. I mean, COVID did not cause any of this, in my opinion. The government caused all of this and because um, it's all about the actions of government. So what have you taken to keep your owners up to date on what's going on? I mean, have you taken some necessary steps to like give them, you know, briefings or you give them, you know, uh, random emails here and there? Do you call them up and say, hey, this is what's going on? And kind of tell us how you're best communicating with your owners. Yeah, I mean, we try to keep them up to date. I mean, it's been, you know, for the longest time, it was just more of the same, right? You, you're not going to be able to evict. Um, we've lost, I, I, we're probably like many other property managers, we've lost, um, the, the, the number of doors that we've been able to bring on during this ridiculousness has vastly diminished from what we normally bring on. And the reason is simple. And you tell me if you've had this business development person, person calls up, Hey, I want to rent my house or I'm exploring that option. And then when the question comes up, well, what happens if uh, you put a tenant in and the next day they, they stop paying rent? What, what? Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. We can't kick them out. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to be selling. And, yep. and that's what's happened. I mean, you know, why would I want to rent a house that I, I have a potential for not getting any rent? And so we. Yeah, it's actually, that's absolutely true. That's happening with us as well. I've talked about this many during the episodes is, is the business development is kind of flatline because yeah. even though we have a biz dev machine, mm -hmm. right, it cooks as well as anybody's in the entire country. It's been flatlining because a lot of people, if they're just, if they're given the option, they're just going to straight sell. Right. And so this is going to turn it's into a housing risky. crisis. Yeah, I mean, it's too risky, right? Why would you? This, this, this adds to the housing crisis for everybody that talks about there's a housing crisis. Well, this doesn't right. help any because now the cost of homes is going up and up and up mm -hmm. and to the point where it's pricing the lower class out of that market and they're stuck renting. And so right. it's, it's just a situation to where, yeah, our homes are renting quick, but no one's leaving them and we're not hardly bringing in on any new properties. So it really damages other businesses and I think the CDC is short-sighted in, in making this type of a ruling because they don't realize how many side effects it does create with other businesses and other industries. And so it's going to be a scary time in the next few months. If you are looking to enhance your tenants' movement experience, cut down on phone calls or emails to you or your staff regarding utilities, then you must connect yourself, your team, and your tenants with Citizen Home Solutions. Citizen Home Solutions takes the hassle of utilities off your hands and your tenants. Best of all, we do it for free. Build us into your tenant benefit package. Oh, and start benefiting from our revenue share program. Yes, we pay you a quarterly commission on specific services your tenant opts into. Want to know more? Give us a call today at 877-528-3824 or visit pmcpartner.com. Let's try to put our crystal balls on for a minute, right? Let's, let's put our genie hats on and say, all right, let's fast forward to October. And this thing actually ends and they actually let it end. 
Uh, what do you envision from there? How do you think the courts are going to handle this? Well, I can I can tell you what's happened in Georgia, which again to me seems to be unprecedented. Uh, we have a county in Georgia uh, that is very liberal, and we have a judge. Uh, it, it's DeKalb County, Georgia, and we have a judge, Asia Jackson, who decided from the bench that she would now legislate. Uh, evictions, but, and she has made her own eviction moratorium, and she has outlawed evictions in DeKalb County uh, for the next 90 days. And um, so it, it's literally to the point where you cannot make this stuff up, because just in case everybody doesn't know, judges don't get to make laws. That's left up to the legislature. And judges don't get to declare things like, I'm not going to do evictions for the next 90 days. That That's not how it works. They're there to follow and interpret, you know, the existing laws that are already there. So, it, you know, what, what's going to happen? I think you're going to have a lot of judges who are going to do exactly what she's done and say, I don't care what the federal government's done. Because uh, remember, the federal eviction moratorium is only on top of the state stuff. So you're still going to have states like California and all, you know, all these other uh, sort of left-wing states that have got their own statewide mandates. For, for no uh, evictions. It baffles me that that all of those have not been overturned. Um, but um, I, yeah, I don't know. So do I see like some massive wave of evictions and foreclosures? Not really, because I think what's going to happen once the, the federal thing is gone, there's still enough, there's still enough state ones in place. Um, and there's enough money floating around now, just all this magic, you know, now monopoly money. Um, that you're not going to have as many people behind. Um, what I do see is massive inflation. And, uh, and I think that's going to perpetuate uh, high rents. Remember just what you said before when we talked about why there's no business development or very little. Okay, great. Now, instead of me putting a house on the market to rent, I'm now going to sell it. All right, great. So that means there's one less house on the market to rent. So less supply means what? Higher prices in rent. So what have we seen now? We've seen unprecedented rental. I've never seen rental prices this high in my lifetime, ever. And we can rent a pup tent, you know, for you know for a huge amount of money. And our rents are up. I don't even know how to describe it. There, some of it sounds unbelievable, but um, the Atlanta market has huge, and it's this all over the country. So that's then perpetuated. Uh, you know, how, how this is going to work with inflation in general, right? I mean, and, and then when you take our normal inflation, okay, people aren't working because the government's handing them free money. Well, and then you now you've got the price of goods and services, just like you said, uh, you can't get people to work. The price of a two by four, you know, I, we bought uh, at my house, I'm doing some some work at my house and bought, uh, we, we've all heard the price of lumber and stuff. Um Seven sixteenths OSB, which is just regular old, you know, cheap plywood that was seven bucks a sheet. Uh, it, three days ago, it cost me forty bucks a sheet, and um, that stuff is insane. If you, I went the other day because I didn't believe it, um, and because I saw on on uh, YouTube actually the um, where the price of a used car, a used Tesla, exceeds the price of a new Tesla. And I'm like, well, that has to be a lie. That, that's not possible because nobody would do that. It actually is. If you go on Tesla's own website and try to buy, uh, first of all, you can't buy. The reason that the price of a used one exceeds a new one is you can't buy a new one because all the orders are full for the year, right? So you got to wait till next year to get one. But if you want to buy a used one, it costs more than a, 20, a 2018 model. And I just looked myself. A 2018 Model S costs more than a 2021 Model S on Tesla's own website. And I, wh what do you do with stuff like that? Uh, this is the first yeah. time in my lifetime, I, I used to be in the car business. You have never, ever, ever seen uh, a situation where people have positive equity in a, in a used car. And right now, used cars are at an all-time high. They've never, ever been valued this high. And um, it, it's insane. I mean, all the numbers are, are crazy.
So thank you for that, because that really helps that that helps the listeners put that in due context. It's always you always hear what's inflation, what's what I know inflation, inflation, you hear that. But then when you give two distinct examples like that, I love it because it really helped us understand what you're talking about. And I agree with you on both those cases. Uh, We saw the same thing in several different instances. So let's talk a little bit more about the scariness that's pending with this new spending bill. And so they're trying to get this thing passed. It is a ginormous is not the right word. It's an absolutely baffling number they're trying to throw across. And it's going to contribute even further to the inflation that we just talked about. Uh, What are some of your thoughts on that and how it could affect landowners, property owners and uh, property management companies? Yeah, my thought is, is that uh, I hope the people out there who are in certain areas of the country, what they, if they're in the areas of the country where though, I think it, I don't remember if it's 17 Republicans who actually have come on board with it. I hope that you're paying attention because if you're in a district where your, your uh, Congressman or Senator votes for something as ridiculous as this, you need to make sure you put them out of office the next time. But uh, it's, it's baffling to me that something that's called an infrastructure bill is, uh, not about infrastructure. It doesn't have anything to do with that. Although I did, and I haven't read it. Obviously, it's how many thousands of pages long. Um, but I saw a couple of comments online by a, and granted, he was a conservative uh, congressman, and um, where, you know, it's supposed to be about roads and bridges, right? And that's what they've touted from the beginning. It's all roads and bridges. We're going to, you know, rebuild our roads. Of course, none of it has to do with anything about roads and bridges. Except apparently, and, and again, don't quote, I've not read this. I, this is stuff I heard from him. But apparently we are going to pay to pave some roads in Pakistan. We, so the United States government is paying to pave roads in another country as part of this bill. I, you know, whether or not that's true, I don't know. I would hope he wouldn't say it if it wasn't. But the ridiculousness that's in this bill uh, is, is uh, crazy. And especially when you start looking at the big brother aspects of it, I, and you guys need to do the research on it, but where the stuff that they're trying to put in the cars, uh, in the automobiles where they're going to track. And, and of course there's conspiracy theories about this, but where they want to track for the methods of taxation, how much you drive and they're mandating as part of this bill, apparently devices that auto manufacturers have to put in the cars starting in a certain year. Um, that are going to track more stuff and uh, that'll be available to the government, of course. Absolutely maddening in every aspect. I can tell you that and how it's going to affect uh, properties, property owners and all this is to be determined. Uh, A lot of it's going to be inflation type stuff to where it's going to be very difficult to keep up with that in the price of rent. So it's only to be determined, but I can tell you this, if you're looking at, at losing sleep and just, infuriating yourself go read into what that that bill looks like because i can tell you there's there's dozens of examples of stuff robert's talking about that makes zero sense let's spend five billion on how to redesign a ballpoint pen you know here in my fingers you know stuff like that would just be maddening and who's that five billion going to it's going to some small organization that always votes democrat or votes republican even i mean it goes both sides of the aisle and that that's called pork right that's what they call it on the hill and it's, it's absolutely infuriating to a certain aspect, but where this relates back to the CDC moratorium is it's just more awkwardness and bad stuff that's coming through the pipeline. And I see very little positive that comes through it. And so, you know, wrapping this up, Robert, you know, I know we're gonna talk about a couple of different things, but I think this has been enough. Uh, I can only stand so much before I, my head starts to explode and, and it just infuriates me even further. But this has been a good explanation about what the CDC or- moratorium is doing in addition to your level of involvement in that lawsuit. So again, I thank you for that because you out there are taking the punches for all of us here that are listeners. And I would hope that at some point you do get some assistance from some of the organizations that are out there. I mean, I could name them, but we all know who they are, the small group organizations from the very big ones to the small ones. I'm hoping they get involved in that fight and help you at some point, if nothing else with some lobbying or some direction or even some funding. You know, that would be great, too. We always encourage yeah, I just that. wish people would become more active. That's the main thing to me. And not stand by when the government does stuff like this. And by the way, it just seems increasingly more more often that they're doing stuff like this. But it's like we all stand by thinking, well, gosh, you know, surely that will that'll never happen. And then, of course, it does. And they're just emboldened more and more. And it's, they keep pushing the envelope. And we, we've got to 
you know, I, I don't want to sound dire, but we've got to take our country back. I mean, we can't, you know, we operate under the rule of law. We operate with private property rights. And, uh, and increasingly, that's, that's being taken away. Yeah, it's, it's maddening to say the least. So, Robert, again, appreciate you coming on, spending the time with us today. I look forward to seeing you here soon at the next conference or in-person event. And until then, man, good luck on this lawsuit. And we're all rooting for you at this side. Fine Digs makes your leasing process lightning fast and 100% fraud proof straight from the applicant's phone. Fine Digs not only instantly verifies income by connecting directly to bank accounts without any documents uploaded, but also uses 3D selfies and facial match technology to perform complete fraud proof bank grade identity verification, allowing property managers to process applications in under an hour. For more information, check out their website at www.findigs.com or reach out to Henson at Henson at findigs.com. This has been a podcast episode by propertymanagementproductions.com. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, leave us feedback, and come back for our next episode.